preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, I have a preference for a more egalitarian relationship between the speakers and the audience. Could you turn up the house lights? Thank you. You can see us. We should be able to see you. Um, thank you all very much for coming. The, the, I've been told that this evening was a sellout and they could have sold it out all over again, but the fire laws did not permit any uh, additional ticket selling. So um, go home and tell your friends what we say tonight. What we're going to do is uh, each uh, of my panelists will speak for 10 minutes and then we'll turn it over to uh, the audience for a dialogue. Uh, the first speaker is Rachel Cowan, who grew up in a Unitarian family in Boston. Her New England roots trace back to the Mayflower. She received her BA in sociology from Bryn Mawr, her MSS from the University of Chicago, and her rabbinic de degree from Hebrew Union College. After 16 years of marriage to the late writer Paul Cowan, she became a convert to Judaism. Rachel and Paul are the co-authors of the highly acclaimed book, Mixed Blessings, Untangling the Knots in an Interfaith Marriage. Rabbi Cowan has spent many years leading workshops for interfaith couples and speaking out on the need for Jewish communities to be more open to non-Jewish spouses and to encourage their commitment to Judaism. Her expertise in this area is one of the many reasons why I'm so pleased that she's joined us tonight to discuss Jewish continuity. Besides being a rabbi and a writer and a longtime activist in the civil rights and women's movements, Rachel is presently director of the Jewish Life Program at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Before that, as program director of Anshe Chesed, she helped to revitalize a dying synagogue and she built an intergenerational, pluralistic Jewish congregation. This past January, Blue Greenberg and I had the good fortune of spending 10 days with Rachel and a lot of other women in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Because the Cummings Foundation funded the Jewish-Palestinian Women's Dialogue Group, of which Blue and I have been a part since, been participating in since 1988, Rachel joined us on this fact-finding trip. I think Blue will agree with me that Rachel proved to be a very significant presence in this group. And I personally came to view her as a wise woman with a luminous face, a big heart, and a holy soul. <sighs> Melanie K. Kantrowitz will be the second speaker. Melanie is a writer and activist who also holds a PhD in comparative literature from Berkeley. She was born in Brooklyn and now lives in Manhattan, where she works as the executive director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. Melanie's books include The Issue is Power, Essays on Women, Jews, Violence, and Resistance, and My Jewish Face and Other Stories. She is also the author of many articles and editor of the Tribe of Dina, a Jewish women's anthology, and the former editor of Sinister Wisdom, a lesbian feminist journal. I'm especially glad that Melanie could be on this panel because of her long and rich experience working and writing as a strongly identified Jew, a veteran feminist, and an out lesbian. Her issues range from civil rights to exploring the intersections of sexism, racism, heterosexism, and anti-Semitism. It's a lot to have on your plate. And she also has worked hard to help define the role of the secular Jew in Jewish and American life. After observing her work for Jews and ra uh, for racial and economic justice, and from our shared experience at a weekend retreat on class, race, and anti-Semitism, I can attest to the fact that Melanie's passion for social change runs true and deep. I'm grateful that she is here to add her perspective as a lesbian and a secular Jew to the subject of feminism and Jewish continuity. 
Blue Greenberg, people are not sitting in any order. Feminists are rebels to the end. Blue Greenberg uh, is a writer, lecturer, scholar, and nationally known spokeswoman for the Orthodox Jewish feminist movement. Before I knew better, I thought of that as an oxymoron. <laughs> Blue has degrees from Brooklyn College, Yeshiva University, Teachers Institute, City University, and Yeshiva University Revel, 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 Revel is better, Graduate School of Jewish Studies. She has taught at the College of Mount St. Vincent and the P Pardes, Pardes? Parties Institute in Jerusalem. Her many affiliations include the Jewish Book Council, UJA Federation Task Force on the Jewish Woman, the Editorial Board of Hadassah Magazine, the Advisory Board of Lilith Magazine, and the American Jewish Congress Commission on Women's Equality. This is a stellar group. She's listed in Who's Who in World Jewelry, Who's Who of American Women, and her other honors range from the B'nai B'rith Literary Award to Bronx Woman of the Year. <laughs> it's my favorite. Blue is the author of dozens of articles and two highly respected books, How to Run a Traditional Jewish Household and On Woman and Women and Judaism, A View from Tradition. And she's just published a book of poetry entitled a special kind of mother. Blue and her husband, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who I consider such a good feminist that he's like an honorary woman, <laughs> live in Riverdale and are the parents of five children. Uh, one of the things I admire most about Blue is the fact that she practices what other feminists merely preach. She is inclusive, open-minded, and a gifted bridge builder. I look forward to her thoughts about feminism and Jewish continuity, and especially her views on how to reconcile the contradictions and tensions between feminist revisionism and the demands of Orthodox tradition. Now, to set everybody up and sort of start the ball rolling, I'm just going to um, pose some of the issues as I see them. I think the premise of the evening is that some people would have us believe that feminism threatens Jewish continuity, that in some way what feminists stand for imperil the survival of the Jewish people and the welfare of contemporary Jews. Our job is to answer the detractors who would label feminists as anti-family, anti-religion, anti-male, anti-child, anti-volunteer work, i.e. Jewish organizational work because of the emphasis on careers, anti-Israel, anti-life, and anti-cooking. <laughs> Some of the issues that come up within those parameters. The issue of feminist spirituality versus the tradition. We are anti-hierarchical. Judaism is intrinsically hierarchical. God the Father, human beings with dominion over the earth. The hierarchies are, are built into the basic ethic, and yet we as feminists are egalitarian and anti-hierarchical. Another issue, when does women's culture or women's, when do women's rituals, say, for example, a, a ceremony on menopause or a lesbian commitment ritual, when do these cease to be Jewish even if Jews do them? And even if we root them in ritual as we see it? How much change can Judaism tolerate and still be Jewish, in other words? What happens when we mess around with God language? What happens when feminists call God goddess? What about the liturgy? What about the echoes that we all grew up with? This is a favorite subject of mine, as those of you know who've read my book. I have a lot of trouble giving up some of uh, the old sounds because they are so evocative to me of the spirituality of my childhood, which is where it all began for me. What are the threats and promises of Jewish feminist scholarship? Plasco says we're filling in the silences. Uh, some of that is perceived as threatening. Some people don't want to know what women, women would have said 
or where women were or what women were doing in all those great gaps in our history that are not written down. My view has always been that feminism is an access route to Judaism. Had there been no Jewish feminist revolution, I would not have come back to my own faith. So all those issues of, in the spiritual religious realm, I hope you will address. Then the issue of feminism taking a kind of universalist approach, which one can epitomize in the word sisterhood is powerful. The notion that we as women could cross boundaries of class, ethnicity, culture, nationality, religion, and so on, and find our unity as women. Um, when we do that, we threaten Jewish continuity. If you interpret Jewish particularity as the issue. I mean, once we meld into everybody else, once we blur out and become universalists, once we become kind of feminist utopians, we cease to be uh, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a separate, uh, a light unto the nations. Um, how do we reconcile that? What about the fact that feminist criteria for a successful relationship personal relationship, does not necessarily include religious compatibility. In other words, feminists say when you're looking for a husband or a maid or a partner, look for somebody who respects you, honors you, who, with whom you'll have a balanced relationship. They don't necessarily say marry a Jew. So it, the fact that that is not part of the feminist criteria, list of criteria, is somewhat threatening. The fact that some feminists undervalue or even dismiss religion as patriarchal, hopelessly patriarchal. What do we do with that one? Then there's the question of our priorities being perceived as threatening and divisive. The notion that we have to choose between Judaism feminism, being a woman first or being a Jew first, solidarity with our brothers, that is, are we breaking ranks when we critique Jewish men's behavior? Are we supposed to have a united front before the world? After all, we're only 2.5% of the American population. We're threatened. We're dwindling. We're small. If we start picking on each other, if we have a gender war, what's going to happen to us? And isn't feminism saying uh, that we should have first the solidarity of gender? Um, what happens to Jews who perceive our call for justice, not as part of the Jewish ethos, that is justice, justice shalt thou pursue, that's fine, but not when it comes to women. That's seen somehow or other as basically challenging the justice mythology. I, I mean, it isn't a mythology if you practice it, but it's a mythology if it doesn't apply to women. And some have accused us of uh, eroding the notion that Judaism is based on justice because it hasn't delivered for us. What about the feminist attack on stereotypes? How does that play into our breaking ranks, our not staying within the community, our not sacrificing everything for the continuity of our people? For instance, when we pick on um, the Jewish mother stereotype, hallowed in some quarters, ridiculed in others, the suffocating Jewish woman or the Jewish princess who is materialistic and frigid and all the things we know from Catskill comedians and Philip Roth that she is. Um, what happens when, you know, when, we, uh, uh, when we really challenge the men who have so demeaned Jewish women by calling us Japs, not noticing that Jap is really another way of saying Jew because it's about a Jewish woman that it's the only form of anti-Semitism that's, that's socially acceptable because it's sexism. When, when you see on a t-shirt, zap a Jap, and it's funny, just substitute Jap, zap a Jew, and it's not so funny anymore. But that notion that men have in some way demeaned women and now they're not worthy of marrying us, we've kind of blown the lid off that problem. We're challenging that. We're saying don't blame Jewish continuity problems on us if Jewish men are putting us down and don't want to marry us because uh, the Jewish cultural um, line is that we're all Japs. So that's a challenge. The critique of the rabbinate. Um, 
the refusal to play limited roles. Then there's the notion of selfish feminists, you know, that we've somehow or other opted out of our proper roles, that we're not, that's why I said anti-cooking, that we're not, that we've somehow or other denigrated our mothers because we don't come home every night and get dinner on the table, and that uh, we don't understand that part of the Jewish heritage is to sacrifice the self for the family or the self for the group. That the self is a, is a, is not a concept uh, dear to Judaism. Um, at what point is women's advancement and women's whether it's career interest or going back to school or saying I need time for myself, at what point does that threaten the equilibrium in a marriage? And at what point is the Shalom Bayat line kind of trotted out to put it to get us back in line, the peace of the household? The birth rate issue. We're not having enough babies. We're too busy building our careers. We're waiting too long to get married. We don't want to be bothered with diapers for so many years. Feminists made women do it. It doesn't seem to occur to Jewish, to the Jewish community that it would be more attractive for us to get pregnant and have babies if the Jewish community leaned on Jewish men to be more participatory fathers or if the Jewish community offered childcare and was more responsive to the realities of today's family life. No, it's our fault. We've decided not to have babies. We're like these, you know, these cold, brittle Amazons. I think that the whole thing has been, by, by feminist critiques, flipped around and we have cast the spotlight on the behavior of Jewish men and Jewish communal organizations, and that also is somewhat threatening. Lesbian lifestyles. Um, why do we say it's okay to choose to lead a lesbian life if it's clear that most lesbians don't have children, although a lot of Jewish men are shocked to learn that a lot of lesbians have children? Um, this is something that is, is important to clarify because uh, lesbian families have got to be included in, the Jew in, in Jewish community organizations and in synagogues or we're going to lose those children. But more than that, the delegitimation, the discrediting of lesbian uh, families and lesbian, the lesbian choice, um, do we have to answer for that as feminists or can we find a way as Jews to say this is part of the pursuit of justice? to honor what people really are, to, to respect the reality of people's lives. Finally, the role of gender in Jewish identity. Um, so much of what has been seen as the reason why we've lasted all these years is because everyone played her or his role. Golda was home with the baby, with the children, and Tevye was out with the milk cart. Uh, all of our parents, whether our mothers worked or didn't work outside the home, there was a very definite role orientation, mama lighting the candles, daddy saying the kiddish, all of that playing itself out in daily life. When we threaten that, are we threatening some basic identity of Jewish selfhood? Um, and what do we do about the nostalgia, about the kind of gloss that's been put on the good old days that has allowed us to forget how much real hard labor went into mama keeping the house and making the holidays happen uh, and all the cooking that now so many men are saying, you know, why can't I have what my mother gave my father? So I leave you with those challenges and uh, I'd like to start with Rachel. Tap it. Okay. okay. No. no. It's not on. If I talk like this, can you hear? No. Swiss. Wait, they're doing something. Oh, they're, turning they're turning you on. There you okay, are. Okay, here I am. Sorry. Thanks, Letty, for the introduction and uh, for the questions. I will deal with, uh, with some of them, but I want to begin by saying what I think, uh, talk a bit about what Jewish continuity means to me, and it struck me in a very odd way how I 
became Jewish was out of a concern for Jewish continuity. Namely, I was married to a Jewish man. I was um, a sort of nothing at the time, uh, religiously speaking. Um, but I thought that if my children grew up to know as little about Judaism as their father did, that would be a crime against history. So I guess that was my first idea about Jewish continuity. And I became Jewish through trying to help my children know what it meant to be Jewish. Um, I also was thinking of an experience I had before I converted back in 1979, being in Jerusalem for the second time. The first time I had gone to Jerusalem was on our honeymoon in 1965, and I had never known intermarriage was an issue before I went to Israel um, and discovered that there were many people who thought uh, that I was um, harming the Jewish people by having taken one of their sons. Um, Anyway, we were in Jerusalem, and I went to the Kotel one Shabbat, and I was... That's the Western Wall. The Western Wall. I was really thinking about converting. It was really becoming very real to me. But when I went there, and I saw the women all crowded in one side, and the men in this large space, and the boys having their bar mitzvahs, and the women standing on chairs to peek over the wall, I burst into tears and ran away and thought, how could I possibly become Jewish? This sexism is... 3,000 years old, How? why would I want to join this? And I really, it was this, I don't know if you've had the experience, but you're, you're pursuing something spiritually rather seriously, and all of a sudden, something, some experience is like stabs you, sort of, and you, and you feel you're, you're falling into a hole. It's sort of frightening. I was lucky to have a teacher uh, in Jerusalem who, who said to me, well, really, Rachel, you know, God may not be at the Kotel for you. There are many other places where you can meet God. And he really helped me sort of work through that hole. But I also was very sustained by, I didn't yet know Blue, but I knew a number of Jewish women who, whose struggles with feminism I had begun to hear about and read about. And thinking about them made me think I really wanted to become part of them. Um, but so obviously for me, feminism and Jewish continuity are the same. But I think more important to me, Jewish continuity, too much in our community is getting broken down to be sort of a thing, you know, like that's Jewish continuity. To me, Jewish continuity is a Judaism that lives, that breathes, that speaks to people's needs, that welcomes people in, that sustains them, nurtures them. And how could feminism not be the same as Jewish continuity? How could we possibly think that in our society today, a Judaism that excludes women, that doesn't um, affirm women's uh, experience, that doesn't see women as the subjects of history rather than the objects, um, could possibly have a future. How could we be educating our daughters to grow up thinking that they were going to be second class and think that Judaism had a future? So for me, the question is somewhat not really a question. It, it To me, they are the same thing. Um, I just came back from a conference, the Women's Rabbinic Network in Berkeley. We had 80 women rabbis, reform rabbis, celebrating together for, uh, for three days. There are today, 20 years after the first woman was ordained, there are now 200 women rabbis. And I was just thinking, the energy, the love, the spirit in that room, the quality of being together was so extraordinary. And what if women couldn't be rabbis? You know, What if all of these people were, you know, someplace else, again, full of energy and spirit, but not contributing it to the Jewish world that much. And what particularly um, was, to me, so moving and powerful was the ritual that, w that we created and experienced there, which was built on the experience of these women back in their communities who all of a sudden are thinking about what are the needs of women to mark uh, ritually? You know, well, how If we in our lives go through life as Jews, and we have very important moments that are sacred to us, and we don't mark them in some Jewish way, that means our Jewish life is diminished. So clearly, those of us who have Shabbat, that is something that's very, sustains us in each week. Clearly, a birth of a child is important. A wedding is important, a coming of age. But think of those ceremonies didn't include girls. I heard a wonderful story in, uh, of, a, of a woman who'd been part of a group, I think they met about 10 years ago in Princeton, and came up with the ceremony of how you um, celebrate the birth of a daughter. And of course, there was no ritual. And they're trying to think, what could you do? And how could it be meaningful? And they decided that maybe one way to do something physical to this child without um, 
cutting it <laughs> was would be that they would wash the child, the baby's feet. And this same woman who had been in the group that um, invented this ceremony, I didn't invent. I mean, they they brought together a lot of traditional texts and based it on a, on a covenant ceremony. Anyway, she was at a at a breed but a, a naming of a, of a baby. And the woman said to her sitting next to her, oh, this is so Jewish. They're washing the baby's feet, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's just sort of within 10 years, this is now our tradition. And I think to some extent, Letty, that to me, the, the answer to your question about are these new women's rituals, are they ultimately Jewish or not, is, is a question that you'd waste a lot of energy trying to answer that. They're going to be Jewish if Jews do them and if they add meaning to Jewish lives. They're not going to be. It, but people in creating something new have to experiment and some things are going to be too far out and some things are going to be really right there. And certainly the, the baby naming uh, for, for girls has become very, very Jewish. Um, what else? Um, I, wa I guess I wanted to you raised so many issues here, and there's one that you had asked me to speak particularly to the conversion and intermarriage issue. But before I move on to that, since that's the issue that is most defined as the threat to Jewish continuity, um, I wanted to just make a few other points. Um, another, another, I think, very important contribution of feminism to Jewish continuity is the fact that women, when we begin to ask questions, we ask questions, how do we talk to God when we, when we have a language that, that when we don't think of God as king? Now, on, on one level, that's sort of an elementary question, and, and the goal of all of us is not to think of God as a body, um, but, there are, but there are levels that we have to get through in our search for finding metaphor that really um, conveys meaning to us. Um, but by beginning to ask all those questions, where were we at Sinai? Where are we in the synagogue? Where are we in relation to God? Where were we in history? We open, by opening the question, we begin discussions, and then other people who have not themselves been feeling so included come to feel included. Men who have not been in synagogue since the bar mitzvah, who don't quite know how to think about God or how to be comfortable, all of a sudden, here's a discussion that they can that they can come in on. So I think we um, also I think we as women coming into communities where we see people neglected, people being on the outside. There are many of us who are single women, and for instance, and many of our communities are so oriented towards couples with families, and it's so hard. I mean, as a as a widow, I have experienced this transition in my life of how different it is to be in shul as part of a couple or to be there as a single woman. And I think that we tend to be very sensitive to how people feel about those, about feeling different, feeling left out. And we try to think of ways to change that. I think that's crucial for Jewish continuity. To talk again about the special issues that are, that are raised by, uh, related to intermarriage and conversion. And you better tell me that's when okay. my time is up, because I get going and don't stop. Um, one thing I think that's very interesting is that all along the, the research, the data that had been done on intermarriage, which showed that basically it was men who intermarried and women who didn't, were, it were based on the fact that studies were done by last name. So who did they find? <laughs> there were many Jewish, you know, McDonald's out there. <laughs> uh, so it had, so Jewish women had not been uh, counted and that had a lot of implications for how we thought about intermarriage, we thought about policy. I think another uh, very big issue in the whole question of intermarriage has to do with the way Jewish men and women see each other. You, you were talking about that. What are images uh, that we have of each other? Um, certainly the Jap image, but there are a lot of, of sort of spoiled prince images that Jewish women have of Jewish men. <laughs> Why do people have such negative images of each other? How do we begin to deal with that? Starting to deal with that opens up the whole question of Jewish identity and comfort with identity and makes it easier for people to come into the community. How do we think about um, the question of including people in our community? When, if, we, if we, as I do, feel that part of the challenge of Jewish life in these days is to make our community inclusive, to welcome people in, we tend to, in the dialogue of our community today, talk about the intermarried as if they're somehow 
those people out there that God knows we, you know, we don't, <laughs> um, they are in fact our relatives, our cousins, our neighbors, our people who are our friends. And I think the experience for Jewish women who marry non-Jewish men is very different from Jewish non-Jewish women who marry Jewish men. It's very often, since it's so often left to the mother to raise the child, if the mother is Jewish, then it's assumed, well, she can do that. She knows how already. And the father tends to be not very involved. There are not many men who convert to Judaism, although there are some. Um, whereas if the wife is not Jewish and she's been given the task of raising the Jewish children, her husband has to get involved. So somehow there tends to be, there can tend to be more sort of sense of community in how that child is raised. So even though the child is technically not Jewish, it has a Jewish last name and has had perhaps a more unified raising. That again has implications for policy, but since we never affect, think about gender in these issues, um, there's also in Lilith magazine this month a really interesting uh, discussion of how Jewish women give money and, and as compared to Jewish men. And as far as I can tell, very little attention has been paid to that, and it would make a great deal of difference as to how successful a lot of uh, fundraising went. Another issue that comes up in the community a lot is um, there's a, a lower rate of conversion to Judaism, and this is usually presumed in the in the Jewish world to be the fault of the Reform Movement, which made Jewish uh, assigned a Jewish status to a child whose mother was not Jewish but who was raised Jewish, feeling that if the Reform Movement still insisted on conversion, there would be more conversion. But I think often. Uh, I think we now live in a society where will, women are just less willing to convert to their husbands, whatever. Um, <laughs> and I think it's really important to understand about women that they can very sincerely not be Jewish themselves, but want their children to be. This is a task that um, many people are capable of taking on. And the, uh, um, to the extent that that's a difficult task, which it is for many people, um, it's, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of work that can be done with those couples to help them in making their decision and finding a place in the community. Um, I guess that's what I wanted to say on those two issues. Um, well, good. Of, we'll, come, we'll come back. That's perfect. Perfect, Rachel. <laughs> you must be timing your sermons or something. <laughs> Melanie, please. Well, it's hard listening and you know jotting down all the things, all the things that I want to say, as well as the things that I came here wanting to say. But I know what was going through my mind through while Eddie was talking was I was thinking about something that Judith Plasco has said, and as Letty said, I'm a secular Jew, which me and I'm an atheist, and it's gotten harder in a way to say that because it's you know it's, it implies that I have something lacking in me. But um, I do identify very strongly as a Jew, and most of the speculation that has gone on among Jewish feminists about what to do with the liturgy and how to relate to God kind of passes me by, although I appreciate very much the work that has been done by Jewish feminists around the liturgy so that I can go to synagogue and feel comfortable. You know, it's made a difference in how I feel going to a synagogue, which I do do because it's it's part of my culture. But what Judith Plasco has said that um, I come back to again and again in my life is somebody was saying what Letty had said about um, the liturgy, the reform language liturgy, um, that weeding out the sexism makes the language not the, not the language she grew up on. It's not the liturgy she grew up on. And she says, I don't feel comfortable hearing it. And Judith Plasco said, we're not the generation that gets to feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that in many ways, this, this has comforted me because it feels like, oh, in many ways, as we wander through this period of finding where we're going, the discomfort we feel is natural. You know, it's part of what we should be feeling because we're not in a place that we know and that the changes that we're encountering um, are part of the process whereby we create a world, hopefully, where the generations that come will get to feel comfortable, as with the foot washing, um, okay. with something more egalitarian and welcoming than what we knew. I was also responding to things that um, 
when Letty was raising the questions about the, kind of the charges against feminism. And I kept thinking, who feels threatened? Who is it that feels threatened? And it's not that I can't answer that myself, but I was thinking about, for myself, operating a lot in um, a feminist context, knowing hundreds, literally hundreds, of Jewish feminists and lesbians all over the country who have become much more deeply involved in their Jewishness, as Letty suggested about herself, um, through the medium, in a way, of feminism. That the summer before last, I was in the intensive Yiddish program at Columbia University, and you know, out of maybe 60 students, there were a lot of a lot of women there who were there as feminists. There were a lot of lesbians involved. I mean, disproportionate numbers of people who had come to that seeking um, content to their Jewishness. It was really very impressive to think about the various ways, not religious and cultural, that. Um, feminism has engaged women back with their Jewishness. But I think the, the main thing that I wanted to talk about tonight is that Jewish continuity is not only about the next generation of, it's not only about having children, and it's not only about the physical survival of Jews, but it's also very much about the survival of what we call Jewishness. And I was thinking that, especially as we approach Pesach, which is above all the holiday of continuity, <laughs> it's, the ho it's a teaching holiday, it's the holiday that Jews who celebrate no other holiday in this country tend to celebrate Pesach. And so I was thinking, what is it that Pesach teaches? And it will come as no surprise if I see that it, it teaches us, the, it reminds us of the historical experience of bondage and liberation. And not only the, just the historical experience, but we're told at Pesach that it should be for each generation as if we ourselves had just come out of Egypt, right? So what does this mean? <laughs> I think it means that when we see people who are themselves in the process of walking out of Egypt, we walk with them. I think that that's that's a lesson of Pesach. And so I want to talk a bit about that because I am speaking here also as a lesbian. And when I talk about Egypt, I'm going to use the Hebrew term Mitzrayim because lest we forget that Egypt is not, Egypt is also itself, you know, it's a country with its own people. It's not just our metaphor of bondage. Um, and what I want to do is tell a, tell a story, which is a true story. Um, of an experience that I had in November of this past year. On the eve of the election in November, I was in Seattle driving down to Oregon. And I, had, I came out as a lesbian in Portland, Oregon in the early 70s. And I lived there for seven years. And I still feel very attached to the lesbian community there. And people were, may remember that in Oregon this year, Measure 9 was on the ballot. And Measure 9 was the most vitriolic, hate-filled, homophobic measure that has appeared on the ballot in any state in the Union so far. It would have banned books from public institutions that said anything positive about homosexuality. It would have stopped public funding to any institution that dealt positively with homosexuals, for example, AIDS counseling. It sanctioned discrimination against homosexuals and so on. So I'm driving down to Portland, um, and I realized that I felt like I was returning, like it was 1933, and I was returning to Berlin in the Weimar Republic on the eve of the election. It was a very intense feeling, and I felt like I was, I was coming back to be with my people in their time of trouble. And um, as I drove into Portland in the neighborhood where I was staying, which is Northeast Portland, and I, you know, if people know the neighborhood, you know, it's not particularly a gay neighborhood. It's kind of a lower middle income neighborhood, integrated black, white. And I saw on every lawn, practically, there was a sign that said no on nine. And I realized that even though the friend who I was going to stay with was a heterosexual woman who had talked about how much work she was doing against Measure 9 and that everybody she knew was working very hard on this, I realized that I had no concept of allies. 
you know, that had not occurred to me that the lesbian and gay community would not be standing alone. And I realized that that came so deeply from my historical experience as a Jew. And what it, and even though I know that there are people who in our most terrible times stood with us, still the sense of abandonment was so acute that I was very moved to see all these signs. And I wanna talk a little bit about what I learned about what had been going on in Oregon around Measure 9. First of all, I saw anti-gay propaganda that literally took Nazi cartoons in which Jews were shown as controlling the economy and substituted images of gays. I mean, they were, you know, I, you could look side by side at the cartoons from Nazi publications and they were the same cartoons that had been copied. I learned that um, Powell's Bookstore, which is one of the world's greatest bookstores, and had, had put out displays of all the books that would be banned if Measure 9 were to pass, had received bomb threats. That people who had been working against Measure 9 had also themselves received bomb threats, that people's cars had been broken into, that brake lines had been cut, and that in fact in Eugene, Oregon, a lesbian and gay man had been murdered. You know, that, it, that essentially it was a war zone. And I say this because even though the measure went down to defeat, still almost half the state voted for it. I mean, this is, this is very serious. But what was also very, very moving to me is to learn that the Jewish community of Oregon unanimously came out against Measure 9 and that the story that I was told from a couple of sources is that and I'm talking about congregations in JCRC and ADL and every organization you can think of, that they got to, representatives got together in a room and six hours later they came out unanimous against Measure 9. And that it was an inspiration also to other communities in the state to see the response of the Jewish community. And I want to read you just a piece of the statement of the Jewish community of Oregon. It said, the Holocaust began with laws exactly like Ballot Measure 9. Those laws first declared groups of people to be subhuman, then legalized, and finally mandated discrimination against them. Comparisons to the Holocaust must be limited, but clearly this is the start of hatred and persecution that must stop now. I am talking about Jewish continuity about the lesson of our most traumatic piece of history from which we as a community are still reeling. And I refer, of course, to the Holocaust and to the delicate language of the Oregon Jew statement. And I'll repeat, comparisons to the Holocaust must be limited. But clearly, this is the start of hatred and persecution that must stop now. Now, the night after the election, there was a rally held, and it was a win or lose rally, and luckily it was win, <laughs> in Portland, Oregon. And all the representatives from all the groups that had participated in this coalition spoke, and so there was a representative from the Jewish community and from the African American community and the Native American community. Many, many voices, and the two voices that most stick in my mind, one is from a man from the Farm Workers Union, which is a mostly Chicano union, and he said, we, we you know, stood by you, and now we're going out on strike, and we need you to, to stand by us. And the second was the voice of a lesbian who said in response to the farm worker, su lucha es mi lucha, which is in my bad Spanish, your struggle is my struggle. I think that this also is a lesson of Jewish continuity as well, even though it's coming in another language, it's understanding the connections between the struggles, and that was the lesson, obviously, the Oregon Jewish community saw. I just wanna say a bit more about that, because I, it's not as though I imagine I'm talking to people, I hope, who would vote for something like Measure 9, but I think that to recognize that something that extreme and vitriolic is wrong is one thing and to take the next step which is to return to the image of people who are walking out of Mitzrayim and what it means to walk with them. I just want to remind people of some of the things that are going on in this city right now around the rainbow curriculum for example and Heather has two mommies this shocking piece of information that children can't be taught so that they don't understand when they hear it from their from their schoolmates. Um, 
about the, the school board elections that are coming up in early May and how important it is that people vote in them. I mean, Oregon is not some backwater, that there is a rise in the right wing, and this is something that we have to think about. You think about Jewish continuity and the threats to it. The radical Christian right is a serious threat to Jewish continuity, and that we have to think about where our alliances are and what we should be doing about them. I'm just going to mention the issue that's been in the papers recently about whether or not Congregation Beth Simchat Torah, the Gay and Lesbian Synagogue, gets to march in Israel Independence Day Parade at a time when gays and lesbians in Israel are risking serious, seriously coming out in Israel for the first time, trying to build a civil rights movement in Israel and in this country Jews are saying that the gays and lesbians can't march in the Israel Independence Day Parade. And I don't want to get into the complexities of that parade, but just to point out that's going on in the city. And finally, to mention the March on Washington that's happening at the end of April. And to say how proud I am that the New York Federation Board of Rabbis in New York has been organizing buses and trains of people to go. And I want to urge people to come as allies. This is going to be the biggest march in Washington history. and. Jews should be there. You know, I don't think we should, um, not to stir up competition, but that the Oregon Jews have a lesson, I think, for us here in New York, that we should recognize the connection of this to our issue and that you let vulnerable minorities be picked off. And um, that's not Jewish. So thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah. Blue Greenberg. Uh, I also, you can, this is a genuine panel, as you can see, we were all scribbling as, as uh, Letty was uh, raising all of her questions. And so I want to, um, I was going to talk about the relationship of feminism to orthodoxy, but I think I'd, I would like to, uh, instead of, um, I'd like to really talk uh, to some of the issues that uh, Letty raised, because I think, uh, and some of them do touch upon the issue of feminism and orthodoxy. I have to say that when I first encountered feminism, which was in the early 60s, early mid 60s, I think I answered all those uh, questions um, affirmatively, all the anti-questions I answered affirmatively. Um, Anti-halakha, certainly feminism um, spelled out a different message. Uh, and um, I'll talk in a few moments about the issue of, of tradition and change. Um, Anti-family, I felt that very clearly. Um, and I, th I think it's fair to say that feminism in it, and I, the Orthodox community being such a strong uh, family-centered community, um, it was not too hard to pick this up. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that feminism in its rather rapidly in its early stages went off on a, or to maybe perhaps to generate enough steam to get off the ground, um, did exhibit certain anti-family tendencies, uh, sometimes very subtly, but I think that they were there and I think it began a process of self-correcting. Um, a certain anti-male, uh, anti anti-men stream that ran through um, I remember feeling very threatened by this since I, was, I wasn't feeling a, uh, antagonistic to men in general, nor to men in my life in particular. Um, Anti-volunteerism, the emphasis on career, etc. cetera. Um, now, perhaps some of this was a misperception coming out of the Orthodox community, but I think that even re in retrospect, reading some of the literature of the times, one could answer yes to all of the all of the anti-questions that you raised. Over the years, and I would say one, uh, I think perhaps that's why I felt myself to be a feminist in the 60s. I could affirm feminism, although I, in truth, I really didn't use that word uh, for a long time. Um, it's hard to remember almost now because we've all taken this for granted and wear the label proudly, but how few of us uh, called ourselves feminists in the 60s. It just wasn't a mainstream term.
term. It was reserved for what we considered were radicals, uh, although we didn't necessarily apply that word. But um, I certainly didn't see myself as a Jewish feminist. And in fact, I was marching happily along uh, to, to uh, completely different paths and never the twain shall meet. Uh, feminism had something to say about equality and justice for women, but it had nothing to say to Judaism, or so I thought until the early 70s, uh, when I was sort of dragged, kicking and street screaming, you might say, not quite, but I was, I was introduced to the idea through other Jewish feminists, and I began to look at it, uh, look at traditional Judaism, at orthodoxy through the new lens of feminism and of equality. And I came to see, and it's still a process for me, uh, the dialectical relationship between feminism and Judaism. That yes, feminism had and has a lot to say to Judaism on the issue of equality. As Letty said, traditional Judaism, although some will deny it and talk about women on a pedestal, traditional Judaism is, has a strong basis in hierarchy. Um, so feminism had and has a lot to say to Judaism, to orthodoxy, and I think traditional Judaism has a lot to say to feminism. So let me talk about some of the specific areas. One is the first issue that you raised, or second or third, was the issue of ritual and change. And that indeed is a difficult question for one grounded in a community in which we don't use the word change, in fact. Uh, we use the word interpretation or reinterpretation, but we don't. So if I say change, think reinterpretation. Um, in many areas, uh, this hierarchy was reflected. Uh, language, as you spoke of, and that's a very complex issue because you don't change language of a sacred uh, text or sacred um, liturgies, uh, and you don't tamper with those things. If you do, you denude it of its sacredness, um, or so the so the strong feeling is. Um, the um, the issue of divorce, the tremendous imbalance in Jewish divorce law, which now just having the last. Uh, a few years, uh, increasing numbers in the Orthodox community are expressing this uh, dissatisfaction or this tension between the, the halakha, Jewish law, and the discrimination or the potential uh, vulnerability of women. Um, the area of learning, which was, it's hard to believe that in the early 70s, there was no study by women in the Orthodox community, or for that matter, women in the other communities as well, of Talmud. Uh, now it's become, it just simply wasn't done for the last 2,000 years. And anybody who did it was stepping over a line. Uh, I grew up in the home of a Talmud scholar. My father is a rabbi. I studied Talmud every single day of his life. He was a businessman, uh, an ordained rabbi businessman. Um, and yet, and very concerned and involved in my sister's and my educa Jewish education, and yet the closest I ever came to studying, uh, opening, or looking into a page of Talmud was simply to pick up the closed books off the dining room table every morning after my father had finished spending an hour studying with a rabbi, a friend of his. And now, well, I'll talk about the change in a moment. Uh, of course, that's changed uh, tremendously. Uh, in terms of ritual, there just weren't rituals for uh, for girls growing up in, or, or unique rituals to, for um, the equivalents uh, for that there existed for boys growing up in the community. Of course, brit and uh, bat mitzvah, um, equivalent to bar mitzvah, etc., or non uh, vocal roles at weddings, etc. That has all changed under the impact of feminism. Some will deny that it's some in the traditional community will say, will still demur when one says feminism, it still rings a red bell. But um, it's all changed under the impact of feminism. 
well, I can't say all, uh, language. There's very little movement there, and it's a very, as I said, very difficult issue to deal with. In Jewish divorce law, um, there's a growing activism uh, in the Orthodox community so that women can never be uh, blackmailed uh, to, in order to receive a get, the writ of divorce, which is the husband's right or privilege or uh, leverage to give or to withhold for reasons of blackmail or spite. And I think that ultimately we're going to come to a point in the not too distant future where we will see that the imbalance is totally uh, eliminated or interpreted out of, of the law. Celebration of women's rituals. Uh, when my two daughters were born, of course, um, when our sons were born, we had a wonderful big communal familial celebration of Breed. When our daughters were born, it was, it just went by with a whisper. Um, that's changed in the Orthodox community. Similarly, bat mitzvah or wedding celebrations. Um, women now play more vocal roles, things that were not heard of in previous generations. In liturgy, where women are um, not counted as part of the communal liturgy, women not counted as part of the minyan, so Orthodox women wanting to be faithful to halakha and yet also have a greater role, have constructed women's prayer groups. You'll notice I didn't say women's minyan, I said prayer groups because according to halakha, um, women still may not constitute a minyan. Um, but um, women's liturgical expression in other forms, even in the larger uh, or the broader congregational setting, so that they don't necessarily feel to, at the per periphery. Here's a revolutionary, and every day something revolutionary happens. A few weeks ago was Purim, and um, in, at a synagogue in Riverdale, the rabbi is Rabbi Avi Weiss, who has been probably the dean of women's prayer groups. Um, there was a Megillah reading uh, that was shared by men and by women. Uh, I'm sure that was the first. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, it wasn't the first. I just read two letters in Jewish Week this week of, uh, saying that this, is ha this had happened in other communities. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are going on. When I said before that I think it's a dialectical relationship, I want to say um, I think there's also something that orthodoxy has to contribute, and that is, and we don't have all the, all the answers aren't in yet. One of the great strengths of Judaism, and I think Letty and I will have a, a, a solid debate over this issue, um, it, one of its great strengths or features, one of the features of Judaism in general, is this notion of role distinctiveness, of gender distinctiveness, which is, of course, contrary to a feminist notion of gender equality. But I don't think it's contrary. I think you can have gender equality and also have gender distinctiveness. And I think that when, um, if we are we totally blur all the lines, of male and female, I don't necessarily think that is healthy uh, either on a cosmic uh, level. And so I think that there is still something to retaining roles, unique roles for women and men, unique ritual roles for women and men, and somehow defining male and female sexuality uh, and yet still have equality. Your point about fe women feminism as access. Uh, I'm glad that you raised that issue because that is, uh, um, has always been startling to me. I am uh, totally baffled by that, uh, and I've seen, I observed it a thousand times so that I know that there's something very, uh, something very unique going on there. How feminism has been a way in for so many women, a way into Judaism. I'm not sure what the dynamic is, but it goes on, and it's truly one of the it's truly the only social movement of the last 200 years uh, that has brought Jews into Judaism and not out of Judaism. Um, in terms of feminism enabling women to cross boundaries, uh, I think it's a very important issue. And 
again, I'm not sure how it works, but I think it enhances. My own experience has been, um, thanks, thanks to feminism, or thank God for feminism, that it has enabled me to reach into uh, to connect with women far beyond communities that, as an Orthodox Jewish woman, I would have been able to connect with um, across denominational lines, across religious ethnic, et cetera, lines. And I had this experience in um, Geneva. I was uh, part of a project by the World Council of Churches on female sexuality in the various religions of the world. When we met uh, in Geneva for a week, this was in preparation for the year of the decade in Nairobi, uh, um, end of the decade, uh, what was it, 1985. Yeah. Um, and I came in on a Friday afternoon, um, and I was tired, and um, we were meeting every day, including one of our sessions was on Shabbat. And uh, I didn't uh, set an alarm clock because I didn't turn on an alarm. I don't use a uh, turn on or off an alarm clock on Shabbat. And I overslept. Um, and there I was, I woke up late, and there I was running through the streets of Geneva, unable to speak whatever languages they speak in Geneva, uh, on my way towards the World Council of Churches. And I thought to myself, as I ran through the streets, I thought, if my grandfather would see me now. And yet, somehow, as I got there, and I spoke about the Shabbat, about Shabbat experience and Shabbat liturgy, etc., cetera, um, the, in, the intense feeling of being what I am as an, an Orthodox Jewish woman in all of these encounters. So I think it's, it's very, uh, it reflects the truth, which is that as you cross boundaries, it gives you a, a heightened sense of yourself, not a diminished sense of yourself. Um, yeah. Okay. And you, yeah, you raised so many questions we could spend um, uh, a few weeks here talking about. I'll stop now, and perhaps, perhaps some of these issues will come out. Thank you so much, Blue. Thank you. Okay, now it's your turn. We don't have mics, so please speak up. And just to satisfy our curiosity, would you say your name? Yes, would you stand, please? The question is, uh, if I would expand on what I meant when I said that feminism is an access route for so many of us, and Blue had corroborated that, and in my case, had it not been for feminism, I would not have come back to Judaism. I could say by the book. <laughs> oh, good. Um, but that's really the, the story of Deborah Gold and me, is how I was raised in a very, uh, what I call high conservative household, like high Episcopalian. Um, and and had an enormous um, connection to Judaism, very deep, was really quite a pious little girl, as conservatives go, Blue, um, and had uh, an experience around the death of my mother and exclusion from the minyan, uh, saying Kaddish for her, um, that simply turned me away from Judaism for um, 15 years. And what started me uh, retracing my steps back. Now, fortunately, I have to say I had something to come back to, which is a whole other issue. At least I was educated as much as people educated Jewish girls in the 40s and 50s. But what allowed me to come back was the fact that there were women rabbis, that there were aliot for women, that women were defining new rituals, doing the scholarship, and that I felt I never again would not count. Not counting in the minion was not counting as a Jew. And for me, when women started to count and to define Judaism for ourselves and to become Jews, capital J, like any other, not a woman Jew or a Jewish woman, but a Jew, that for me was the turning point and allowed me to begin that journey through feminist rituals, through my capacity to sit in a service and listen to liturgy that spoke not only of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but 
of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, and my capacity then to feel part of this continuum that we've been talking about tonight. Yes. <laughs> I'll repeat her question. Good. <laughs> That's so nice. <laughs> this woman said that um, she relates to Emma Goldman's statement, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution. She said, if I can't pray, it's not my religion. We should make a sampler of that. <laughs> Hi. Rachel, do you want to take that as a representative of the Jewish mainstream? <laughs> the closest we get to it? A reform I, rabbi. I mean, the, com the communal yeah. world. Uh, that's a good question, Barbara. Um, I'll just throw out, and may, there are probably are people here who have ideas too, but I, I think the primary thing is to, for all of you and for those of us who are here, to feel really strengthened to feel strong in this perception that we have. I think I know for myself that um, <clears throat> I've had a number of experiences of late, partly um, projects that our foundation has been involved in, which is one reason I was in them, where women really um, got together and talked about these issues, but didn't just it wasn't just a political discussion, but it was study, it was experience, it was whether it was our our trip meeting uh, with the Palestinian American women, or whether, but but really going through Israel and learning a lot about ourselves and about Israel, uh, feeling reinforced that we as women are not marginal. That this isn't just decoration that's sort of nice to have, but the really important thing is Jewish education. Say what kind? When we talk about Jewish education, who are we educating about what? Um, to always ask that question. And I think a lot of us can ask that question more and more. I, I find myself in a lot of meetings that now I really am beginning to to always ask that question when I didn't. And I think um, people haven't really been doing that enough yet because probably people haven't quite had the self-confidence. But I think this opportunity of Jewish continuity, this crisis the community feels about are we going to have a future, as Melanie says, it's not just our children, but really what are, what are we maintaining, what are we developing, what are we creating? Um, to, for women to always insist that our take on this issue, and we have different takes, I mean, we, we may be four old lefties here, but we're not <laughs> also. I mean, we, we come from concrete communities with very different um, experiences, but we all in our own communities ask this question, and I also think it's really important to extend the question beyond just who we always talk to, but to really, um, and I think in the Federation world, I think there's a lot that women can do there to, again, my experience, I haven't been really, in, Blue has a lot more experience than that, she could talk to it, but, but I've had a lot of experience of seeing women feeling very marginalized in that world. I mean, having this series of really boring events given to them as the thing to do to be Jewish. Um, and the big deal is, would you give your own money rather than just having your husband write the check? What about, there's so much more that we could be giving than that. And I, I think really just to keep asking that. I, I didn't repeat Barbara Dopkin's question for those of you who didn't hear it in the back of the room. And I know Melanie wants to address it. And that was, how do we translate these ideas back into the mainstream? How do they not just remain with four old lefties up here? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know. It's not four old lefties. It's long term. Yes. More in 
the whole mm -hmm. idea of tikkun olam and the Jewish world looking inwardly at its own values. Yeah. Melanie? I think one thing I wanted to say as somebody who has in the last few years um, come to understand more the organization of the mainstream Jewish world. You know, I'm somebody who felt very alienated from that world and did not think of it as having anything to do with me or being anything that I could speak to. And what I discover is that I don't think there's hardly an organization, um, a mainstream organization in this city, hardly, that I know of, that doesn't have one or two fabulous people who would disagree with nothing that's been said here, plugging away, working very, very hard in those institutions. I mean, it's, I think the, it's the great secret of the Jewish mainstream that there are wonderful progressive people, women, many of them. Um, Hillel's, you know, Hillel's have a rep on campuses of being pretty conservative places, and in some places that's true. And at the same time, I have met, I speak a lot on campuses, a lot of the people who bring me are these young Hillel directors. A lot of the times they're women, and they're saying to me, oh, would you speak about lesbian issues? Oh, could you speak about black Jewish issues? I mean, it's, you know, that the Jewish mainstream is not that separate. You know, progressive Jews sometimes think that the Jewish mainstream is like all uptight and doesn't care about anything. And it's, it's really not true that there's a lot of activity going on in that world. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And I think the other thing has to do with constituency. There are a lot, a lot of Jews who are not particularly identified, affiliated, who are floating out there in what I've come to think of as the political diaspora. <laughs> you know, who are active as um, feminists, who are active as whites in anti-racist work, who are not identified as Jews and who are coming in various ways to think about the re their disproportionate numbers in these movements, to think about why is it that so many Jews are present there, to think about their relationship, the relationship to their Jewishness. So I think there's also an issue of the people, um, the Jews who are in some way gathering in um, for I think the wave of social action that is coming to be upon us in this next decade. Blue? Yeah, uh, uh, as you said, uh, Barbara, that we're four old lefties, I said to myself, oh my God, what did I leave out here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, never thought of myself that way. Um, the, um, you have to listen to your enemies more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think so much has changed in the Jewish communal communal world uh, in the last decade, and that you know there's still a way to go, but it's charted along an irreversible path. And so I, you know, I take great hope, and uh, I, I don't. I look. I see it as a cup is half full, not the cup is half empty. And it, I think it's only going to get better. So I, I don't have a sense of despair. Occasionally, I hear an individual horror story, but then on the other hand, I hear I hear and see so many extraordinary examples of women in uh, Jewish communal leadership um, giving of their talents in a variety of different ways uh, that just simply didn't exist before. Uh, the second you raise a very important point about tikkun olam, and um, I, I referred it before early, a moment ago to the Orthodox community when I said about the incredible learning. I focused on Talmud, but in just in general, uh, certainly in the Orthodox community, there's this, been this uh, virtual explosion of women's learning, and I guess in a certain sense that's how feminism has articulated itself within the Orthodox community. But I think that's one of the ways, in, in general, there's so much more learning going on by Jewish women in, uh, in, in every uh, entire, uh, along the entire spectrum of, of the Jewish community. And, um, you know, so, and that's taking in and also giving out and enlarging oneself and connecting to one's roots and intensing one, intensifying one's identity, etc. And every that's available to every single Jewish woman wherever she is in her life. I just wanted to um, say one thing about the. F no, I'll come back to it. <laughs> I do find Judaism to be a 
I can hardly wait for the answers here. <laughs> Did everyone hear this? I hope good because I can't possibly repeat. Do you want? Do you want to start, Melanie? Well, I mean, in a way, it's you know, I think it's easier for me to respond because I'm not a fundamentalist, and you know, my, I mean, you know, we're also told at various places in in you know, that we're not supposed to wear mixed fibers and we're not supposed to, you know, there's all sorts of things that we're told we are and aren't supposed to do. And obviously, to me, those things that you've just said are repugnant and I don't feel any need to resolve them. What I would say is I... I Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm sure that we would probably agree on this. Yeah. 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 Okay, I just... Yeah, let me just say one more thing about it. But what I also don't feel is, um, well, okay, there's patriarchy and Judaism, and therefore I'll throw it out. You know, this is my history and this is my culture, and that the different relationships that people have to the religion and to the tradition, um, it's important to me to engage with it in some way. I feel like that's part of being what I'll call a Jewish adult, <laughs> that being a Jewish adult means in some way I wrestle with the tradition and that may mean that some parts of it I'm going to set aside and say this is not redeemable. I mean, to me, there's a lot of it that is not redeemable, but there's a lot that I choose to to keep, to transform, to look for help with how to transform it and keep it going because I don't think the answer um, to critiquing a tradition is to say, okay, we'll make something new, you know, put it away. This isn't good anymore. Blue? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all yours. I, I thoroughly disagree with you on uh, on your definition um, because in, which, indeed, which of his definition? hopelessly Judaism is hopelessly oh. patriarchal. I disagree with the hopelessly. Let's let's start <laughs> with that. Uh, um, right. Exactly. Because indeed it is patriarchal. Uh, there's much in the Torah that is patriarchal. And part of it is, I think, understanding that the Torah is eternal and has eternal values and eternal truths. And it was also given at a certain moment in history in the language and the context of those societies. And if one, if um, we can't, we don't, Jews have never and will never uh, just stop with the Torah and say, you know, that is that. The, the entire ta the Talmud, uh, post-Talmudic literature, all of this was an attempt to understand in context both of the eternal word and of the moment, you know, the continuing moments uh, walk through history, um, you know, how Jews understood these laws. Rape is an excellent example. And you're, you're absolutely right about the biblical laws of rape. Uh, including the fact that if a uh, you know a victim of a rape, um, uh, when there's a penalty, when there's a fine to be paid, um, that the fine is paid to the father, etc. I mean, you could go through all the laws of rape, uh, even the notion the notion of um, you know if she could cry out the reason. It, uh, she's considered an accomplice, so to speak, and just the notion of a woman as an accomplice to the rape. So let me just tell you, it is abhorrent. Um, but just, let, so let me give you a little update in the Talmud. There's, um, there's a little Talmudic pericope where um, a woman comes before uh, 
she accuses someone of a rape, and the rabbi says to her, but didn't you enjoy it? Which is a terrible question. And she says to him, and this is all given in the Talmud, and she says to him, it's, if someone took, stuck their finger in, this is, what am I telling this story for? <laughs> If someone stuck their finger in a jar of honey and then stuck it into your mouth, would you like that? Or you might think it's, a, I won't go into all the details there, but at any rate, and he says to her, you're right, and from then on the definition of rape became, becomes as a woman defines it, which is far more progressive than any other religion or culture, including our own times, where the laws of rape are still... Uh, are, are, I can't even think of an, a bad enough adjective uh, for contemporary laws of rape. Um, so I think, as Melanie said, you can't you can't rewrite history, but you can understand its progression and you can undergo the process of reinterpreting it. And moreover, I think one has to say, even as one looks at the Torah and says it's there's a lot of patriarchy and inequity, et cetera, imbalance. There's so much there of, you know, of great value that has shaped the, the course of human history. Uh, so I think we have to look at the whole thing. Rachel? I think we studied in rabbinical school the, uh, the Torah as a sacred text of our people, not something that was handed to be believed as it was um, as it as as it was as it is presented that it is the sacred text of the Jewish people and it is with that text that we have lived and grown and suffered and and wrestled and for far too long women were not written about not included in the discussion although I know women discussed it and thought about it we were there all along and it's just our voices weren't recorded now they are being recorded they are being woven into this new fabric that is contains the threads from the old. And from my perspective, uh, we, are, we are given this, I have chosen to become part of this gift of this, this relationship with the Almighty, with the, with the Spirit that, that is, whether we, I would call it God, you might call it um, human transcendence or, or power or, or beauty, whatever you would call it, that which is in us, which is, inspires us to seek perfection we're all engaged with it we all it's a treasure we all have and to throw it away because we don't like some of the text if we were to do to the torah what what we want to do with some parts we'd have this completely whole torn ripped shredded document which in every synagogue would be torn and shredded in a different way uh and we'd have nothing binding us together and i think the fact that we have it and that we are empowered to learn and love and fight with it and reinterpret it is so powerful and so beautiful that um, that is, for, for me, what keeps me going whenever I come across those verses, which are hard to deal with. In the back there. Could you speak louder, please? Ah, hi, Sharon. <laughs> Uh, there, there's there been a rash of uh, feminist activity and feminist conferences on college campuses. Do we believe the issue of Jewish, femini fem uh, Jewish feminism, Jewish continuity has sparked this activity? Mm. In other words, is that yeah. is fear of uh, mm. loss what's doing it? You know, I think it would, I would have to know what was going on on the particular campuses. My my sense more and of what I've seen going on on campuses is that there's an encounter that happens sometimes on campuses with anti-Semitism that is very shocking, I think, to Jews. And that, and maybe I'm projecting here because this was certainly my own experience, although it wasn't on campus. It was later, but it was outside of an environment where I took Jewishness very much for granted. That encountering anti-Semitism made me start thinking a lot about my Jewishness, and I think that um, 
campus is one environment where Jews come up against other come up against others and experience whatever's going to be experienced, and some of that is anti-Semitism. And there is a lot of anti-Semitism on campuses. So I think that's part of it, and that sparks an investigation into, well, what does it mean to be a Jew? I simply don't know if college students are thinking about Jewish continuity or if this is something that's coming in, you know, the terror of the Jewish mainstream is being pumped in through the Hillels. Mm -hmm. to, um, but I don't think it would be finding its its voice in Jewish feminist conferences from that terror of Jewish continuity. I don't think that's quite where it come. I think it's coming more from um, the women themselves and in investigating what does it mean to be a Jew and a feminist. And I also know when I, you know, when I talk on campuses, I meet young women who have read Letty's book. I meet young women who've read The Tribe of Dina. I mean, Jewish, young Jewish women are reading, they're reading Jewish feminist stuff. You know, it's out there in the air for them. And it's now part of their, it's part of what it means to them to be a Jewish woman. Anybody else have a guess? What I'd like to do, uh, since it's late and um, we, we're all going to hang out a little while, but people are starting to leave, is uh, call the evening to a close and say that we'll all meet you out near our books or up here or wherever. And thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.